Imagine facing the grim shadow of death for a crime that never bore your fingerprints. What if the scales of justice were tipped not by truth, but by the murky waters of racial bias? This, tragically, was the reality for Johnny D. McMillan. This film, rooted in the harrowing truths of history, portrays the valiant fight of a black man seeking justice for his people. Prepare yourself for a poignant journey. This cinematic experience, rich with spoilers, demands your full attention. Watch intently to the very end and embrace the spirit of sharing, commenting, and subscribing. In 1987, in Alabama, USA, a man named Walter Johnny D. McMillan was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death for the murder of Rhonda Morrison. Johnny was innocent and wrongly convicted of a crime he didn't commit. He had to stay in prison until his execution day. Meanwhile, a Harvard Law School student named Brian Stevenson was interning to become a lawyer for death row inmates. One prisoner asked Brian why he went to Harvard where there were so many white people. Brian said he wanted to become a lawyer to help others, but he wasn't sure how to do it best because racism was still a big problem in America, not just for criminals but also for educated people like him. After graduating, Brian planned to move to Alabama, but his family, including his mother, disagreed. They were worried about the severe racism against black people there. Many people had died just for defending themselves. Brian convinced his mother that he wanted to fight for those who needed help the most. Arriving in Alabama, Brian met his partner, Eva Ansley. They planned to open a legal service for death row prisoners with a grant they had received. However, they faced a setback when the person supposed to rent them office space suddenly refused because they were lawyers for death row inmates and because Brian was black. So, Brian stayed temporarily at Eva's house and planned to run their business from there. The next day, Brian went to the prison to meet his clients in death row. The prison had a cruel guard. Brian was even asked to strip for a search before entering, though lawyers usually didn't have to be searched during legal visits. But they did it because Brian was black. He felt deeply humiliated. In prison, he met several inmates who usually came to their lawyers' homes. One of them was Herbert Richardson, a former doctor in the Vietnam War, convicted for accidentally killing a woman with a bomb. He had PTSD from the war. Brian's job was to try to help them avoid the death penalty because their lives still had meaning, regardless of what they had done. Brian then met with Johnny D, who was living with his lawyer because he ran out of money and was sentenced to death. Johnny D was sick of the promises previously made to file appeals until the Supreme Court trial, but still got rejected. According to Johnny D, black people like them will only be oppressed and spit out. They don't even hesitate to accuse people without evidence because they don't need it. Even false witnesses can be easily presented. Tired of all this, Johnny D rejected Brian. He thought Brian couldn't fight the corrupt people out there. There would be no justice for black people. When returning to Eva's house, Brian tried to recheck the files of the people he had visited in prison, so he couldn't sleep. Brian told Eva that he believed Johnny D was innocent because the accusation was based on the testimony of a single witness named Ralph Bernard Myers, a criminal who was also being tried in a different murder case at the time. Eva and Brian believed that since the police couldn't solve this case for a year, Johnny D was eventually chosen as a suspect based on the testimony of a criminal who might have given false testimony to get a lighter sentence. Brian then planned to meet with a prosecutor named Tom Chapman. Brian said that he had serious doubts about the certainty of Johnny D's case. He then expressed his doubts in Johnny D's file, but Tom rejected it because Johnny D had already been declared guilty by a jury, and his job was to maintain the jury's integrity. But Brian countered that his job was to seek justice for his client. Hearing this, Tom gave a thin file of witness statements and prosecution. If Brian wanted the rest, he had to file a motion in court, Tom said. On the way home from there, Brian tried to go to Johnny D's family home, which was in a black neighborhood, set back from the main road. After entering, Brian met Johnny D's wife Minnie. Brian was surprised when many neighbors gathered who also wanted to hear Brian's story. One of them said that Johnny D was innocent at that time. They were all grilling fish to raise funds for the church. They promoted the event throughout the town until they worked from morning until night, and Johnny D was there cleaning the truck with his son John and his friend Jimmy. Many of them went with Johnny D on the day he was accused. Brian said he would help without Johnny D's family paying for it. After that meeting, John introduced Brian to his friend, Darnell. According to Darnell, he had something to prove Johnny D's innocence. According to Darnell, Bill, the man who saw Johnny D's truck near the murder scene, made a false statement because Darnell was working with Bill from 8 a.m. to noon. Darnell said Bill was arrested for theft, and when he gave his testimony, he could be released without charges. Brian then persuaded Darnell to sign an affidavit so it could be used to reopen the case. Darnell was initially afraid, but finally agreed to help. The next day, Brian met again with Johnny D. Because of Brian's efforts to meet with his family and neighbors, Johnny D. began to believe in Brian. Brian gave Johnny D. news about Brian's progress in reopening the trial. Hearing this, Johnny D. agreed Brian would be his lawyer. In the detention room, Johnny D received news from Herbert that his execution date had been set. Johnny D told Herbert not to give up because they already had Brian on their side. 
Herbert's fate was very sad. He went to Vietnam to defend his country, but was thrown into jail like trash, despite suffering from PTSD caused by the war. One night, Eva received a call because she was working with Brian. Naturally, Eva was terrified to hear about a bomb threat under her house. When the police checked, they found nothing. After this incident, Brian said he wouldn't blame Eva if she wanted to quit, but Eva refused. She believed in doing what she thought was right, even if it meant being ostracized by her friends or receiving threats. Eva then asked what they planned to do for Johnny D. The next day, Brian and Eva went door to door asking residents about the murder of Rhonda Morrison. Many refused to talk after learning they were defending Johnny D. However, Brian managed to get a former police officer who found the body to share his story. Eve also found a flyer made by Johnny D's family about a fish fry fundraiser for their church, which could be evidence. Eventually, Brian found a house to use as his office. He named it the Equal Justice Initiative. There, Brian and Eva's business began to grow. Besides focusing on Johnny D's case and his friends, they started taking on other cases and hiring new employees. One day, Darnell called Brian for help. Darnell had been arrested for allegedly giving false testimony, even though he told the truth. Brian spent time trying to drop the charges, seeing how scared Darnell was and believing they couldn't fight it. Darnell then refused to help further and asked Brian to apologize to Johnny D's family. Brian was upset and went to meet Tom and Sheriff Tate. He demanded the false testimony charges against Darnell be dropped as they were baseless. He wanted this so Darnell could testify in court. Tom and Sheriff Tate dismissed Brian's requests. They agreed, but followed up with news that Brian's motion to reopen the trial would be rejected, even though Brian hadn't officially heard it yet, as if despite his courage. On his way home, Brian was stopped by a police car for no clear reason. When he refused to get out of the car, he was even held at gunpoint while another officer rummaged through his files in the car. After that, the police left. In prison, Johnny D wasn't surprised that the authorities did this to Darnell. Brian's motion was likely to keep being rejected. Brian was shocked to hear that Johnny D had been sentenced to death before the trial. It seemed black people in Alabama faced a cold war just to get justice. One day, Brian took a bold step. He decided to meet Ralph Bernard Myers, the only witness who put Johnny D in jail. Brian struggled to get Ralph to talk about his testimony in court. Ralph only mentioned that while detained in Escambia jail before testifying, he had asked the sheriff about the Morrison patrol two months before the trial. Brian immediately informed Eva that there might still be evidence stored in the Escambia court. With help from a new employee named Brenda, Brian managed to get in there and duplicate evidence recordings and interview transcripts that shocked him. In the recordings, Ralph was interrogated by Sheriff Tate, where he admitted he knew nothing about Rhonda Morrison's murderer. I don't know anything. Brian kept trying to file a motion to reopen Herbert's case, but a few days ago, they received a reply that the motion was denied and the execution would proceed. Herbert's execution day arrived, and he said goodbye to Johnny D and his other friends. He was going to be executed in the electric chair. Brian, who came before the execution, apologized to Herbert for failing. Herbert's execution began, and there were shouts of support for him from above. For the first time, Brian experienced the most horrible thing in his life after Herbert's execution. It motivated him more to help Johnny D. That night, Brian found something in Ralph's file. He went back to meet Ralph in prison. Brian reported that he had listened to a recording of Ralph's interrogation, where Ralph said he knew nothing about Johnny D or the Rhonda Morrison murder case. Brian showed Ralph a file stating that after home in prison, Sheriff Tate transferred two prisoners to death row. The first was Johnny D and the second was Ralph. Ralph replied, why did Ralph give false testimony? because he didn't want to be executed. Ralph had lied to avoid the death penalty and instead got 30 years in prison. Brian convinced Ralph to testify in court to help Johnny D. Ralph initially refused, but Brian was so persuasive that Ralph eventually agreed to do the right thing. On April 16, 1992, a hearing was held to decide if Johnny D. deserved a new trial. Ralph, a key witness in the previous trial, was brought in. When sworn in, Ralph pretended to be sleepy and said he was woken up at 2 a.m. by officers to come here. Ralph seemed to signal to Johnny D and Brian that he was threatened. He looked worried and scared to testify. He kept saying he forgot and didn't remember because his testimony was six years ago. He played it safe by answering everything he didn't know. Brian knew Ralph was afraid of Sheriff Tate, so he blocked Ralph's view of the sheriff. Brian then played on Ralph's psychology. He told Ralph to look at Johnny D and see an innocent man separated from his wife and children for a crime he didn't commit, and Ralph was the cause. After Brian repeated his question, Ralph firmly answered that he did not see Johnny D at the crime scene at all. Not at all, he said. Then Tom asked questions and said Ralph changed his story because he was disappointed with the previous deal and did this to get a lighter sentence. Ralph strikingly replied that he didn't care anymore. They could do anything to him and insisted that whatever he said about Johnny D was all lies and he could confirm it. Ralph's testimony led to more evidence and witnesses being presented in the trial. Brian also brought a former police officer who gave the true testimony when he found Rhonda Morrison's body. He had refused to lie in Johnny D's trial six years ago, which is why he was fired. 
A doctor from the mental hospital, who was Ralph's doctor, also testified. Ralph had a mental breakdown when he was about to be executed in the electric chair if he didn't give the statement the sheriff wanted. In the trial, there was a lot of evidence not shown six years ago. Because of this, Brian asked the judge to reopen Johnny D's case. Brian did well, even winning over a previously harsh cop to let Johnny D see his family. A month later, the judge made a strange decision, ignoring solid evidence. He found Ralph's testimony irrelevant and dismissible due to the pressure Ralph faced after his testimony six years ago. So, there was no proof that Ralph lied back then, and Johnny D wouldn't get a new trial. He was sent back to prison for execution. John, Johnny D's son, was upset and angry at the unjust decision. He was deemed disrespectful to the court and got arrested. Once again, there seemed to be no justice for black people. Johnny D was right. They always faced obstacles. They didn't want to admit they'd wrongfully punished an innocent black man, especially when a black lawyer like Brian proved it. Brian was sad. He should have brought Johnny D home. But things got worse. Ava then reminded Brian that he was important to the community. With Brian, they could fight for justice for the first time. Brian reunited with Johnny D's family and neighbors. Despite the disappointing trial, they had one more step. Brian planned to submit evidence to the Supreme Court, hoping to overturn the judge's decision and force a new trial. No guarantees, but Brian believed the Supreme Court wouldn't ignore their evidence. John said, even if this worked, his father would still be labeled a murderer. So, Brian decided to take the case to a TV show. Johnny D was interviewed on a famous show, and so was Ralph. If the court could be manipulated, then the public could judge through this medium. Even Tom, the prosecutor, was moved. Johnny D's fate now lay with the Alabama Supreme Court's decision. Brian hoped they would rule once they saw the case file. Three months later, the Equal Justice Initiative office grew. One day, Brenda got a call that the Supreme Court's decision was out. Brian rushed there, and the previous judge's decision was overturned, granting a new trial for Johnny D. This news excited the community. Brian was sure Johnny D would be freed, as he was innocent. Tom, the prosecutor, refused to comment. As expected, the path to justice was tough as Brian prepared for the new trial. Tom filed a motion to delay the trial for a new investigation. Facing this, Brian bravely went to Tom's house. He couldn't believe Tom wanted a new investigation despite knowing Johnny D was innocent, especially after the Supreme Court approved the evidence. All Tom's witnesses had admitted their mistakes. Tom had nothing left to prove. This new investigation would find nothing. Brian then asked Tom to join him in withdrawing the charges. Hearing this, Tom told Brian to leave his house. On March 2, 1993, racism was still a problem, even in the courtroom. For over an hour, Brian's family and supporters were told to wait outside. They were only allowed in after the seats were filled, under the sheriff's orders. Inside, it was clear that black people were standing at the back, while white people sat in the chairs. Judge Pamela started the trial. It began with Brian asking to drop the charges against Johnny D. Brian spoke up, explaining that this case might seem to prove the defendant's innocence. But considering a black man was sentenced to death a year before his trial, with no black jurors, relying only on white witnesses and ignoring 24 law-abiding black witnesses, it was clear that Johnny D. was innocent. Those who tried to speak the truth were threatened. Brian said this trial was more than just about one man. It was a test to see if we would be ruled by fear and anger or by the law itself. He pointed out the unfairness in the system, where rich guilty people are treated better than poor innocent ones. If justice was to protect every citizen's rights, regardless of wealth, race or status, then Johnny D's nightmare should end soon. Brian argued that the charges against Johnny D were made up by those who cared more about their reputation than the truth. By doing so, they were disrespecting the law, and that wasn't justice or right. When it was Tom's turn to speak, surprisingly he agreed with Brian and supported dropping the charges against Johnny D. The trial ended, and Johnny D was free to go home. Brian had succeeded in saving Johnny D after six years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Johnny D packed his things, his freedom celebrated by other prisoners and Ray, who cried at this victory. Johnny D could finally return home to his family and community. Brian's victory brought new hope to cases of false accusations based on racism. On April 2, 1993, state senators invited Brian and Johnny D to speak about the death penalty. The movie concludes with a scene when Brian said that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth, it's justice. The character of a nation is not reflected in how we treat the rich and privileged, but in how we treat the poor and disliked. If we look at ourselves closely and honestly, we'll see what we need. Justice is all we need. Thank you for staying with us through to the conclusion. Should there be a film you desire us to review in depth, kindly express your preferences in the comments below. Please support us so we can produce with better tools and with more high-quality movie recount. With click like and subscribe. Leave also a comment so we can improve in the future.